Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside with me, Tianwei. Let's now turn to trade talks between China and the U.S. The two sides are planning more negotiations. The latest round of trade talks in Washington, D.C. earlier this month included discussions on intellectual property rights protection, non-tariff measures, and trade balance. So what are the incentives for both economies to work together with technology competition likely on top of the agenda? How can both sides find a win-win solution, or can they? Earlier, I talked to Fred Tang, the president of America China Public Affairs Institute, and also Andrew Brown, the editorial director of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Here's what they have to say. Let's listen in to our discussion. I want to start with you, Fred. You've been over the years working on short-term and long-term relationship between China and the United States. Now, short-term does not necessarily look that promising. But how do you articulate the current realities and the long-term future you're looking at? Well, the short-term, actually, uh, I do think there are some promising results coming up. Okay, tell us about that. I think, you know, t President Trump is the only person who will decide whether there will be a deal or not. And I think it's coming close to it. I think when this deal is being done, both countries will have critics saying that this deal is not a good deal. However, I look at it as a win-win situation. The United States will win economically for the short term. They will probably win over $1 trillion of goods being purchased but cannot be purchased in one year, so it will be six, eight years of purchasing. So that's what the United States gain, and certainly President Trump will take that credit. China will actually gain politically and for the long term because uh, what their performance in terms of this negotiation, they're gaining the international's recognition that they are stable and reliable stakeholder, mm -hmm. and they're responsible in dealing with this matter. They did not yell or scream or any of these stuff doing this. So for a country that's getting rich, sometimes it's hard to get respect from others. But this is an opportunity for them to showcase they have that leadership. But of course, always the argument from the Chinese side is that people here in this country also need those goods coming from the United States as long as it is being done in a fair and balanced manner. Well, fair and balanced is, is, is tricky. Uh, I do think that both countries need to work with each other. Mm -hmm. You cannot isolate yourself and domestically, indigenously creating chips and so forth so that you do not rely on other partners. The whole world, actually, we should be buying from each other in terms of the United States should buy 5G from China, and China should buy chips from Qualcomm. And this is, this is how the world always works. It should not be just isolated. Andy, you agree with that? Uh, I certainly agree with parts of that. I do believe that the U.S. and China are heading towards some sort of an agreement on trade. Um, and this will take the heat the, out of the relationship now. Um, I don't think, though, that it will resolve the underlying tensions between the two countries. And, of course, it depends what sort of a trade agreement we get, right? I mean, how ambitious is it going to be? Exactly. The enforceability, I think, is really the critical issue here. Uh, but the long-term trends, I mean, it does seem to me, uh, I now live in the United States, having lived in China for the last 20 years, and what I'm seeing uh, is really the start of what appears to be a Cold War. As worrisome, as you mentioned earlier, there's one issue probably that is even more important among all, that is the technology competition. Now, when we say technology competition from the Chinese side, uh, it is well accepted that we are lagging behind the United States and even Japan and Germany on many of the areas. But the question really is, has the war already started uh, before actually there is a reality of a war? Uh, China is now pushing hard up against the technology frontiers. Well, I think it's, it's incredibly positive that China is pushing the envelope in these areas. One would wish that China does become a technology superpower, but does so in a way that allows a collaboration, a continued collaboration between the United States and China, and that, I think, is falling apart. Uh, Why is it falling apart? Well, this is not. This is not. This Cold War is not your parents' Cold War. This is not the Cold War of the 1950s and 60s. This is very much a technological Cold War, and it's being fought out in the areas of cyber and space and advanced industries, the industries of the future. Mm. 
So I understand you've been working hard on that, meaning the New Economy Forum, for example, uh, that is uh, established by Mr. Bloomberg and working with the Chinese and many of the Asian economies as well, for example, in Singapore. But the question really is, will those kinds of efforts be able to prevent the Cold War in technology, a new economy, or is it only going to increase concerns because as both sides know each other better, there seems to be increasing concerns. Andy. Well, I, I don't think it, I, I think this, this technology Cold War is going to be with us for quite some time. I don't think there's any short-term resolution to this. If you, if you look at what's happening now, uh, on the U.S. side, uh, they're coming up with a very long list of technologies which they want to keep out of uh, China. Uh, foundational technologies, artificial intelligence, neural networks, machine learning, and then the applications of those foundational technologies in areas like autonomous cars, uh, robotics, advanced uh, manufacturing, uh, and so on. Now, if that happens, if this program is implemented, it could actually have a very serious impact on entire global industries. I was in Silicon Valley recently talking to startups uh, in the auto sector, and they are genuine. People are working on things like navigation systems, uh, working on radar, uh, this type of thing, advanced technology. They're very worried that the global auto industry could split into two, mm -hmm. that you have a U.S. auto industry and you're going to have a Chinese industry and they're going to be forced to choose. That is very dangerous to say the least uh, because if you look at the advantages of both economies, one certainly has a lot of advantages in technological development. Others, for example, China, as big a market as it is, it is providing enormous amount of data which is very crucial for any new technology and economy to thrive. So splitting the two will be a loss for both of the economies, but we do not know whether that will be the reality to you, Fred. How do you look at that? I mean, it seems that if that is the case, we are choosing the worst scenario. Well, I think that if we're talking about a technology Cold War, shots are already being fired. Now, in terms of how to stop that, whether you know, it would take very rational leaders to stop on both sides, uh, I do not think this is a scenario at this point. Uh, so what does that mean is that how long will this last? Whether this is a three-year thing or this is a eight, ten-year uh, episode. So I think that the, the longer it prolongs, uh, the worse it's not just for United States and China, but for the whole world. Mm -hmm. uh, United States looking at China right now because there's a competition coming up and they're seeing China is doing all this accomplishment. But they have to remember that it's not just China. The whole world, many of the countries are developing their technology. China landed on the dark side of the moon this year, and Israel just did. I mean, you have other countries are also competing in that space. Then the United States have to look at how it has to deal with all of this. Mm -hmm. I think competition is good, and, and, but, uh, and, and it will really help each other to, to move ahead and to grow and to do even more for the, for the whole world. Andy. Well, I think China is going to have to open up. Uh, it's going to have to pursue faster and deeper economic reform. Um, and there's a lot of pressure bearing down on China to do precisely that. Mm. So you are telling me in a very diplomatic way that for China, it's mainly the challenge of further opening up so that more players will cooperate with this country. And that is providing incentive for U.S. and China for the future. Is that what you're saying? I think it is a mistake to believe that China's problem is Trump. Uh, I think Trump is articulating the complaints of a very wide swath of the U.S. business community, and not just the business community in the United States, in Europe and other countries as well. The Trump problem doesn't go away, even if he wasn't to be president for another term. I think that's here to stay. So addressing these problems, I think, will require a greater degree of economic openness in China to address the root source of the complaints. And I am reasonably optimistic that we will see that. I see three interlocking and potentially transformative trends in the Chinese economy. Um, the first of these is China's increasing reliance on the private sector to drive growth. Entrepreneurs, Chinese entrepreneurs, complain about exactly the same things as their U.S. counterparts. They want more competition. 
The second point, I think, is the financial system of China, pressure bearing down from finance. China is going to have to start funding its development through overseas capital, by attracting overseas capital. It's going to go from a net lender, a net creditor to the world, to a net borrower. And that's going to imply the opening of the Chinese capital account. The third thing I see is the Chinese consumer. The Chinese consumer is, and particularly the younger consumer, is demanding authenticity. They don't want fakes. Mm -hmm. They are also demanding customization, both of products and of services. Okay. But, but, but how will that, in a way, be able to solve the problem that you have just mentioned? That is really my question. You know, the so-called technological Cold War. If you have an ideology that is so rooted, as you just mentioned, in the United States, well, these changes, even with good intentions, not for the United States but for China, be able to serve the job? I think the short-term picture is actually quite grim, and I don't think that there is any short-term resolution to this problem. I think the, the, the resolution, if indeed there is one, is in the medium to long term. What can be the solution if technological-wise, standard-wise, for example, are being already split into two parts, and that's going to be dangerous, particularly for the long term? Well, I think that the U.S. Uh, businesses, their demands on China is one motivation creating profit for the U.S. corporations. But they have to look at, from China's government perspective, is that the government want to have a stability. They want to see what's in it for China when they open up these markets. How are they going to help their, their jobs? One of the things I've been telling my U.S. friends is that the kind of M&A, the mergers acquisition, acquisition in the U.S. You buy the company, fire the people, and then you make a lot of money for yourself. It's not going to happen to China in decades and decades to come. So they have to understand what is Chinese government's perspective, how to keep the country stable growth. And the other is like financial industry. It's going to be very difficult to long term open all open because there's too much too much risk involved in that. And China has to be feel comfortable and confident that they have the grasp of this con the system and they have to have a control of that before they can totally re release to foreign companies to be running a uh, these type of industries mm -hmm. open to them. So you are saying that if to get things done on a pragmatic basis, right. these issues are need to be taken care of again, taken into consideration particularly. Right. Will that be difficult? So what we aim to do is to set up a forum for discussion and debate. Yes, indeed. Um, so the new economy, for when, we, when we think about the new economy, we're thinking about, first of all, emerging economies led by India, China, uh, but also the economies of the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and we're looking at emerging technologies. And we start with the premise that the center of gravity of the global economy is shifting east, it's shifting away from rich con uh, economies, the US, Europe, uh, towards Asia, uh, particularly China. And we have to talk about that as the new reality. You know, we have to have a conversation about the tensions, the conflicts, that this quite naturally uh, generate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, in talking about it, that's of course the first step. Uh, and framing the conversation in a way that accepts the rise of Asia, that accepts the rise of an alternative uh, center of gravity for the global economy, I think is already uh, a first step towards resolving some of these issues. To talk about the realities. To talk about the world as it actually is, not how we would wish it to be. So, as the world it is, uh, Fred, what can we do about this so-called Cold War um, technology and Cold War about the potential for our economies? Well, I think Cold War in itself it portrays a distrust uh, between the two parties, and that's why we have a Cold War. And to repair that, we have to look at some of the basics. Mm -hmm. And basics is communications and exchanges. And communications is not just about my side, what I want from you. I also have to look at what, what you need and how do we can work together. Uh, China has been talking about a sharing of a win-win for the future, uh, whereas the Western country is talking about values. And I think that's where the both sides differ. Uh, China feel that you can both can win and both can prosper, but at the end, I am still who I am and you are who you are where sometimes Western, maybe through the Christian Judaic missionary type of a model, they would like to see you become 
just like me. You dress like me, you talk like me, and, and so forth. So these are things for both sides to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes communication also takes the timeliness, whether you should inform each other a month ahead, not 10 minutes before. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's very timely, meaning as it happens, you let each other know. So I think that these are the things that if both sides can look in the long term, yeah. but we do need professional people in the team to achieve those things. Now, Andy, I think you and Fred understand it very well that we are in the uncharted water in a way because it used to be when you talk about the new reality, there was war, uh, there was a huge political transition of power when the new reality was eventually being realized if you look at the past history. That's why what people call Sioux City's trap. But now we do not want to have war. We do not even want to have cold wars to begin with. Uh, and that transition has to be done under this circumstances. People choose not to have wars. So can we do that? And I think that would be an interesting test for all of us about our talents, about our capabilities, about our wisdom, and about the strategies. So Andy, to you, what is crucial at this moment? You know, there's an awful lot of talk about the Thucydides trap. I think actually the Thucydides trap has sprung uh, with this uh, a building technology cold war. Are the US and China destined for war is the big question. Um, I don't know. I'm not in the business of advising governments on what they should do. No. Uh, but it does seem You're rather the other side, uh, scrutinizing the government I'm, I'm when you are a journalist and a commentator for long. Exactly. But it does seem to me, however, that it is absolutely essential for both sides to try to separate their economic, their commercial, their trade disputes from their differences over security. And if they can't do that, then we really may be heading towards a full-scale Greek tragedy. Do we have the wisdom to do that, Fred? I, d I don't think there will be a war or the conventional sense of war dropping bombs on each other. But I do think there is a competition and there are certain scores need to be settled. In terms of what format it will take, uh, I don't know. But right now it seems like we're already trading this type of things. A at the end of it, both sides will get hurt. And just like uh, there's always casualties in any war and it's not going to be one-sided. I've been talking to many, both in China and overseas, about the realities we're facing right now. Many of those with very reasonable mind have been painting a gloom picture, shall I say. Um, however, uh, as we always know, that we have to do something about it because we have no other choices. We can't let things just go downhill as it is by the others. So if I could invite some advice or actions from you, both of you. What do you think are the priorities we need to settle right now? So at the New Economy Forum, we're, we're less focused on trying to solve all the problems no. in the world. Uh, many of these problems are And you are can't through one conference. We're not an international organization. What we do try to do, however, is look at the areas that we're focused on, trade, finance, global governance, climate, and bring corporations together with government to focus on practical areas of collaboration and cooperation and try to make a meaningful difference on specific and very concrete areas, uh, solution areas. And that really is the uh, essence of the New Economy Forum. It's trying to bring businesses together with governments to have pragmatic conversations about change. Pragmatic conversations about change, I love that. And to you, Fred, as well. Yes, we're also looking at the milestones that can be accomplished in the long run. Uh, in 1971, when President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, when they visited China, that was activity. In 1979, when both countries established diplomatic relations, that's a milestone. Mm -hmm. Since then, lots of activity, not enough milestone. We're looking at the countries that the United States is friendly with. What do they have in common? And the three areas that we identify is travel, trade, and security. Travel is we support a mutual visa waiver program. Mm -hmm. Actually, this program makes both countries safe. They will know more about the travelers coming into the country 
then you have a piece of paper that's six years old, just stick, stick it on the passport because you give information to each other. Uh, if both countries can es establish that, that's a closer relationship. Second is a bilateral free trade agreement. Again, United States certain different models. We're studying all of those models, and hopefully, in the future administrations, when they're ready, we're able to to show them some of the work that we have studied. The third is the security partnership. There's so many areas: anti-terrorism, cybersecurity, law enforcement coordination, pandemic disease control, including Arctic Circle con uh, coordination and space coordination. These are all the areas that can both countries can positively work on but they need to have trust with each other first. Thank you so much for the two of you, both your time and your energy, not just for this discussion, but also real stuff and real work for building this bridge. I want to thank you, Fred Tang and also Andy Brown. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us.